hello. Uh, who here has used the IPython notebook already? <sighs> okay, there are a lot. All right, well, I still want to surprise you. I hope I surprise you. Um, yeah, I wanted to use these two in conjunction because it, I think a lot of my enjoyment of my job has to do with using IPython notebook in particular. It's super amenable to sketching. So what I'm going to do is walk you through some of these, um, so kind of the stuff I wish I knew right out of the uh, box with IPython, and then some, you know, a typical workflow with pandas. But keep in mind that um, your workflow can be pretty open. There are a lot of different ways to do things with data, uh, and pandas is super flexible. And you know, this is more like a sketching environment. Um, so here are all your imports. Uh, you should be able, you should be all set with the requirements file that I uh, included in my repo, but. Um, if not, that's okay. And you also don't have to follow along unless you want to. Could you say again where we... Oh, sorry. The, um, the links are actually here um, on both of these boards. It's bit.ly slash OSB 2015 pandas. Because pandas are great. So I probably don't really need to make a case uh, for open source to you, but it does have you know, particular applications in science. And I can go into those in greater detail, but you know, the TLDR is whether you're trying to reproduce your scientific workflow um, or you know, read your own code. It's, it's nice to um, do whatever you can to improve the reproducibility and the transparency. So you know, when I was trying to imagine who might come to this talk, I was thinking of other people like me who maybe have worked in labs or people who are interested in um, civic data hacking and want to come up with a way that they can do work um, that they can share with other people and then they can repeat later on. Um, if you've ever used something like Excel, you, you go through um, a menu a few times and it's hard to retrace those steps and it's also hard to convey that process to somebody else. Uh, and of course, open source software is typically uh, significantly cheaper. I was, I was looking at um, SPSS a few days ago and just laughing. Um, <laughs> and also, if you'd like to learn more about applications of open source software to scientific data analysis in particular, you should attend Amy Boyle's talk, our very own neuroscientist slash developer um, and pie lady, on Thursday afternoon. So, uh, so I. I gave away my own punchline. So I'm just going to walk through about six features in the IPython notebook that I love. Um, the first one is tab completion. I don't know if you've used the, yeah, I know, can, it's like, can I get a hell yeah? Uh, uh, tab completion saves me. Um, you can use it not only for the, it's like, oh, I want to read, but what do I want to read? Look at all these options. So not only is pandas, the, what I'm showing you is pandas, but in the notebook, um, super powerful, and you have a lot of options. But you can say, yes, that is exactly what I was looking for. And what was the name of the file? And you get a list of files here. Um, I won't go too much into that. Just explore that. Basically, when in doubt, just hit tab, always. Um, and you have to remember a lot less. Uh, this built-in documentation, you just uh, question mark and then whatever you know, method you're interested in. Uh, and you get this, first of all, this is how amazing read CSV is. Um, these are all the parameters that you have available to you. But all the parameters and their descriptions are listed here, so you don't have to go anywhere else for the documentation. Uh, markup. I love their markup. Um, I don't know how familiar people out here are with LaTeX, but I love it for, yeah, it's gorgeous. Um, I love it for equations. I'm actually revisiting calculus for my job right now, and when I'm trying to take notes on what I'm doing, it's so satisfying to have the tech right there in line with the code that I'm writing. Um, so it can handle Markdown, HTML. This is a beautiful GIF in honor of OS Bridge because rainbow sparkles make everything better. Um, tech and syntax highlighting for other languages. Um, my team is mostly using R for data analysis. So if we want to try to speak each other's languages, it's nice to have something like this built into my code. Magic methods. Uh, I won't get go into these more specifically yet, but if you're interested in what these, these methods that are just built into IPython for you are, just you know, percent quick ref that, and then you get a list also in this window of um, other magic methods you have, like for LaTeX or looking at your history or um, navigating uh, the bash terminal inside of the notebook. 
And this insanity, which is saying, well, uh, it's not enough to just show the R code to my uh, coworkers. I actually want to be able to run it in this notebook. And you can do that as well. Um, so you know, IPython notebook started, I think, 2011 or many years ago. Um, Fernando Perez uh, started the IPython notebook, and then it's since been like moving in the direction of this, like Jupiter. Like IPython is still a thing in itself, but um, Jupiter is now more, a broader, more language agnostic project, um, which can take R and Julia and other languages as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's basically, yeah, it's the IPython notebook made into something bigger. Um, yeah, but IPython is still an entity unto itself. And what are you using? This is Jupyter. And that's what you usually use now? Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if I need to repeat those questions, but basically, yeah, our, our IPython notebook and Jupyter are the same, and you know, basically for all intents and purposes, yes. Uh, multimedia. Another favorite thing of mine. Um, I could embed an image here. Uh, like this, this here, for example, is actually just HTML that I put in the notebook. You can also embed videos and other images, um, other code. And basically, if there is a medium you want to try to represent in the notebook, go ahead and look for it. And finally, the sharing is really easy. Uh, one of my favorite bloggers, Jake Vanderplas, who works at University of Washington, actually puts uh, notebook HTML in his own blog, which I think you know, renders really beautifully. You can also export it as a PDF. I've not tried doing that. I'm a little uh, suspicious of how it looks. Has anybody here tried that? All right. And you can view them directly on GitHub now. It used to be you had to you know, export it as a gist, then you have to use Ruby, boo. And then you have to um, put it on <laughs> Notebook Viewer. Um, now it just uh, renders right inside of GitHub. Yes. Oh, are you talking about my, my talking smack about the gist? Yeah. No, I, I just mean you don't have to go through that whole process. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now we're on to pandas. And pandas, if you've used, how many people here have used R? Cool. Um, you may also have used pandas, but if you have not, you notice they uh, bear some similarity. Um, Wes McKinney is actually a huge fan of R, as I understand it, and thought that there should be like a Python response to that and its amazingness. So once again, you know, I'm curious about what I can do with, say, pd.readcsv. It could pass in all these parameters. Um, I used to be kind of intimidated by it, and I, I thought like it's excellent that whatever tool you're using to read in a file does a lot of the. Um, allows you to front load a lot of the munging work that you can ant anticipate. When you first get started, you may want to do things um, by hand, like I've done here. I've, um, I've expanded that munging into discrete steps so that you can see more like what the narrative of going through a data set would be. Um, but one thing I, I did here was just um, for the sake of demoing it, was you know, using the dtype parameter and, and saying, well, OK, I know I'm dealing with zip code data, which I guess I wouldn't if I were necessarily if I were seeing this for the first time. But I, I want to encode that as a string. And um, I would say the number one thing that I wish I could impart to anyone working with government data is that you should never look at anything with a zip code in a graphical uh, tool like Excel or Numbers, because it tries to be smart for you and drops leading zeros. Um, so yeah, just always keep that in mind. Uh, so Python doesn't do that, because Python is a little bit dumber, right? Um, so when I first load in a data set, I just want to see what is there before I've done anything else. So uh, th this, is, um, this is from the IRS website, and it's adjusted gross income per zip code for the United States. Uh, these are a lot of details. Um, I've actually linked you to the documentation if you want to walk through that, but for our purposes today, I wanted to take a subset. Oops, you didn't see that. Uh, I was noodling around. Okay, so we've loaded it in, and it actually just looks like a table. Um, let's see. I 
told myself I wasn't going to put in any new cells. Uh, here we go. So you know, this is what it looks like, a pretty typical setup. And uh, aside from that, you can use this view to look at the data type. Is everybody here familiar with data types and what they are in Python? Or should I say, is anybody not clear? Nice. OK, well, this is open source bridge after all. Um, so, so this is saying, like, I did indeed successfully load in zip code as not an integer or float. That would have been an issue. And the rest of these are floats. <laughs> I'm not interested in those. I, I like these variables. I've walked through this data set before. Clearly, the process of figuring out what variables are going to be relevant to you will take longer than what I'm showing now. But um, this is the total amount of money earned in a zip code. This is a very strange format. Um, and this is the population. So I've pulled these in. You notice that I can call uh, columns by their labels, which I think is much easier than, say, um, trying to refer to their position or describing every one of the other columns that I'd like to drop. I also have uh, a deep paranoia about doing anything to the original data that I loaded, so that always exists as its own entity in my notebook. I, you know, your mileage may vary. I, I actually only really know about my own workflow when it gets down to this boring stuff, but I like leaving one version completely intact. Um, and then I've, you know, I run this info method on my, um, my data set again to just check what data is there. Whether, all, uh, whether they have the same number of rows for each, because this will tell me if I have any NANs, not a numbers. Um, <laughs> I like that word. Anyway, if you want to take a subset of the rows, um, you can do that as well. And I like using this, this, this form. You can also just pass in, oops, I'm sorry, like this, but it's less intuitive. Something that I thought is interesting about this particular implementation is that when you pass it IX and then name your rows, it's inclusive. So you're, you're calling the actual label, which I find, um, I don't know, right for this. You don't like it? You don't like it because it's inconsistent. Yeah. Um, I agree. Um, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> you're right, it's garbage, Just throw it out. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, I agree the inconsistency is kind of a problem, um, but, I th but I like the trade-off of it's being like, if this is a tool for somebody who is not super familiar with Python to um, start looking at data, it's being inclusive is kind of intuitive because you say like, oh yes, yeah, six through 11 was what I wanted. Uh, I'm terrified right now, so I can't remember if I do this later, so right now I will just tell you what the data is. Um, actually, I don't like that. Oops, I renamed it later. Ignore me. OK, I renamed them because these are not super helpful. Um, yeah, you can, you can go back to see how exactly I do each of these things later. But I thought if, if somebody were to hand me something, batteries included, to get started with data, what are the things I'd want to know? I'd want to know how to rename things, drop things, whatever. Um, so anyway, this is the um, rename method and also, uh, uh, I'm passing in place equals true here because this is a, a feature of pandas that I think everybody should understand right out of the gate, which is whenever you do some kind of transformation to a data frame and then you get something back, let's say, oh, this is actually only like this subset of five um, columns, like for instance, when I did this and reassign and assigned it to a new variable. Um, this is, oops. This is a, a view onto the data. You haven't actually transformed it in place unless you have specified, yes, indeed, this thing that I just did to the data frame, I want to be in place. Um, I have looked up this, this warning many times. If anybody wants to tell me more about it, they can. But this is essentially, like, this is not saying that what I've done is invalid, but that I should be aware that it's what I'm doing. And here's our column subset again. So I'll walk you through what's here. For a given zip code, I have six AGI stub labels. And AGI stub is actually their name for a tier, uh, an income bracket for that zip code. So this isn't actually valid, but for you know, this, this area in Alabama, we have 1,600 people making zero to $25,000 a year gross. And this is the average um, within that amount. You may see some shenanigans here. If you've caught on to any pattern here being odd, um, it's because 
this data is in the thousands. Um, that's how it was, it's entered in here, so I have to do that transformation later. Um, and it is the, I should say, this isn't the average. This is the total amount of money that the government got back from people in this income bracket in this zip code that year. Does that seem kind of weird to anybody else? I mean, it's kind of cool. I didn't, I haven't done anything in this data set with it, or this um, demo with it, but it would be interesting to see the distribution of people in income brackets by zip code and state. But anyway, there's that. Oh, also, if you want to just take, if you just want to sort of get like a schema, you can also just pass head to see the top five rows. I also like seeing using tail because um, that's often where you see wonky data. I don't know if you ever noticed that. Like everything looks great the first five rows, and then down here it's like nan dead. What did you do here? And, like <laughs> things you didn't really expect. So. It is not. <laughs> Wherever that 99999 nine, 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 nine is not a zip code. Is it in a song, though? Well, 99 is Alaska, I think. Yeah, this is another problem. In this government data set, um, quintuple zero is in Alabama, which, you know, it would be. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Not logically, because that started in Massachusetts. But anyway, um, yeah, this, this is not actually valid, and this is. A lesson in government data is um, it's it's noisy. You got to be real committed. So hmm? One weird thing I noticed: uh, if you're an overseas resident and you have a local, you have to file taxes locally. Your zip code will be five zeros. So yeah, I think. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I haven't investigated it because I wind up just dropping it. But um, if we're getting data from, say, Puerto Rico, yeah. it could be passed in that way. Um, that's what I'm guessing because there is like a non-trivial population and amount returned for quintuple zero, um, but I haven't read in the data where they describe that. It's just assigned to Alabama. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is another you know major function in in data. So I'd say like the top two things that I wind up doing with data transformation is a group by, which is available to you in SQL also, and merging and joining. And so uh, group by is, um, is what I used because I wasn't interested in, in this particular instance, going through what's going on for each income bracket. I was interested in each zip code overall. Uh, so I wound up running a group by. Uh, so then we have just like the total number of people in the zip code and the total amount. And then, yes, a wild zip code appears. It's the suspicious quintuple zero. I don't like it. Um, you have a couple of options with, with what you do with that. Uh, and this is you know, another one of the, this is why data scientists have a job in part. Um, you are making decisions. Like a, a machine could say, this doesn't match on another data set. But um, a human could say, well, is, is that an issue this time? Like whether you render something null and still report it, uh, or whether you eliminate something from your analysis altogether. Still being transparent about that which is why it's nice to have everything embedded in this code. Somebody can see what decision I made with that. Um, so you know, a nice illustration, for example, of, of these potential differences is that if I just, oh, you know, I had a lot of fun with this, and I might have, um, I need to maybe actually run all this code again. So I'm just going to, mm-hmm. OK. So in one, in one universe, I've decided to just keep it and assign it to NAN. And actually, I, I could do that with the quintuple nines as well. Um, but if you leave that in there, you decide to assign it that, then you get this nice report. You, you understand, like, yes, this wasn't a valid zip code, but we still have the data that was included there when I, when I pulled it down. Um, and that, that makes for you know, an average population of 10,000 people per zip code. Uh, but when I drop those NAs, I wind up with an average reported as um, 5,000 people per zip code. So if I were reporting this to my boss, and this has happened, I mean, not this particular. <laughs> um, like, for instance, at my job, uh, I report to people who speak with like, our, our banking partners in Spain. And I could give them double a population. Um, just by not being diligent. So 
I'm gonna do this too. Mm -hmm. This is not reproducible. I just changed some code and I shouldn't do that. Don't do what I do. I'm your mom. It's fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, marginally different when we drop the nines as well. So that's a, that's a, a meaningful difference. Um, drop the NAs. Now I want to do a few other transformations where, um, and this is, this is another thing I love about pandas, is I can just say, you know, I actually want AGI grouped to have a whole new column, which is corrected for that being reported in the thousands by the government. And that's exactly what I got to do. I got to make a whole new column that says this is the actual amount. And then I wanted to do just like this you know, quick calculation on that. It's really as simple as writing out the, the logic of the math itself here. And I get to pass that in to a new column and have it here as well. Um, uh, you may not use this right away, but I've found apply super useful. I, I use anonymous functions all the time to say like, well, okay, there's a thing that I'm going to, there is a function that I'm going to want to apply to this column, and I want a column returned with that having, I, I want a column returned as, or a series um, returned as the output, and that is what it'll do. I didn't like how it was originally rendered, so I decided to round it so it's only whole numbers. Um, is all that clear so far? Cool. And then, once again, I'm checking in. I, I think that it's important. I didn't want to overwhelm everybody. It would be ugly. But like every time I do something, I check in with the data. I'm often repeatedly asking for info for, for um, in this case, it's not as useful, but for describe. I'll leave that in there. I may push this after having noodled around with it so you can see what I did in this presentation. Oh, I could have. Tab completed. Right, so I'm constantly checking in um, because you, you can see unexpected results. As you get um, uh, more advanced with your programming, you, you can write like assertions, um, checking for whether um, uh, when you've done a transformation, the data frame is the same dimensions as when you passed it in because um, that has happened to a friend of mine with a merge where I don't know how he did it, but he wrote some, a function, some function that when he applied it, like transposed the data, and he didn't have any idea at first. Uh, anyway, don't do that. Um, and I also just wasn't interested in this data any longer because as it turns out, I should have described the group by better. As it turns out, um, I don't actually want the sum of those um, categories, one through six for each zip code, not actually anything I need to have, which is what happened here. Um, Again, because terrified and sweating, I just raced through group by here. Um, so group by is one of the most useful things you can do with a data set. I wanted to group by uh, the zip code. I wanted that to be the limiting factor. And then I could pass in a few things here, like, like mean or like the count, for example. But I just wanted to sum the um, gross income per zip code, you know, collapsing those income tiers. And then I also reset the index because just because I wanted to, but if I hadn't, Um, the zip code winds up being the index, which um, is also useful if you want to um, use join instead of merge. But I'll get into more of that later. Right. So that's what we've done so far. OK. Oh. And as it turns out, we got into merging. Uh, merging in pandas is super fun. This is, this is where um, the most interesting stuff happens in all of data, in my opinion, um, is, well, in this case, it's not as interesting because I'm just pulling from data within this same information I got from the government. But if, say, I knew the top ice cream place in every zip code in the United States, and I ought to, uh, <laughs> I could join that on this IRS data and say, is there a relationship between adjusted gross income and Ben and & Jerry's versus Baskin Robbins? Um, probably not. If I were rich, I would be swimming in both. That's fine. Um, so in this case, what I wanted to do was, you know, once I got this information back, when I, when I do a group by, I'm asking for, in this particular case, I asked for a sum. And pandas is, you know, because it's in between, like, say, assembly and Excel, 
it's, it sometimes is smart for you. And one of the ways in which it is, is it says it's incomprehensible to some a string. So I'm dropping that column altogether when I return something for you in a group by. Um, so that means that I lost the state information um, for this data set. And I don't like that, because I want to see, um, I want to see how much better Oregon is than everywhere else, frankly. Uh, that this doesn't tell me that. Only my experience does. So anyway, I make a, another subset that I've described as geo, which is actually just the zip code and the state. Again, this is another tool that you'll find really useful, is just dropping duplicates from a data frame. So if in every regard um, a row is similar to another in this data frame, it's dropped. So I wind up with just this list of, and you'll see again that zero, this quintuple zero has reappeared because I pulled from the original data again. Uh, so yeah, this is just zip codes and the states they're in. And then I wind up merging this, and I have my, my final data set. Somehow with the AGI stub again, because I may have forgotten to drop that. Oh, that's good. That's helpful. This is because I went back and redid things. Also, you know, you see me scrolling around, but it is possible to navigate this entire setup using just um, keyboard shortcuts. It's super efficient. And you can look those up. If you just look up, like, IPython keyboard shortcuts, you can do everything that way. Right, so here's my final data set. Um, There's that zero zip code again. I thought I said I wanted a left. Hmm? Yeah. This is what we call a live demo. Oh, OK. I actually, so this is why I shouldn't have changed things in my um, data set on the fly. It's cool. I'm not panicking. It's fine. Oh, it's because I didn't drop it up here. Hey, remember when I said I shouldn't have done that thing? Yes. I did that thing, and it wasn't good. Uh, yep. Where am I? Yeah, I'm into it. OK. I'm doing the thing again. I did change it back. Uh, you didn't see that. Oh, no. Well, y'all, that's OK. This is actually my worst nightmare, but um, it's fine. It's really you have see that. <laughs> 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 oh, there's usually like you know, a pit in hell, and my whole family's there. Um, and they're going to pearl. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ice burn, OK. Now it should work. And everything's going to be fine. Ah. This is fine. The last five minutes didn't happen. Can I edit this tape later? All right. Yeah, that's really important. Oh, not panicking. I'm like made of sweat at this point, And I'm trying to tell myself it's the room. Um, yeah, I was, this is a lesson in reproducible code, right? Probably shouldn't have changed that thing in line. Which I then did again. It's fine. Um, uh, yeah, so this is the final data set. Um, look at our pals, Massachusetts. Oh, no, I don't know why this is. OK, never mind. I do know why. It's fine. OK, um, this is my final data set. It's sorted by AGI. And I said ascending equals false because the default is ascending. I'm not interested in that. We want the highest income. Um, which is 250 people, and I did check this out. I, I ran this many times the last few weeks trying to understand this. There are just 250 people live in large in Florida, and we should go find them <laughs> and live in their pools. <laughs> they are at 33109. <laughs> it won't be hard to find them. Yeah, they probably filled with ice cream. Um, yeah, so it looks like it's really good to live in that place in Florida, but you know. Uh, particular zip codes are not as, as useful, so I did another group by with state. And you know, I wanted to show you that, look, look, that you can chain these things together. So in one line of code, you get everything done that you want to, which again, you know, heart python, heart pandas. So it looks like while this place in Florida is where we really need to go, 
If we can't make it that far, we should go to DC. Um, Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts, California. None of these are particularly shocking, I guess. Um, but yeah, this is their weighted mean AGI. I didn't round this, so that's why it looks so horrible. But real talk, this means that um, the weighted mean income here is, yep, it's over $100,000 a year. Oh, really or it wasn't 2000. The Obamas are like, what, 10 million, pay 10 million a year in taxes, right? And they live in Washington, D.C. I got to make new friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Yes, yes they are, uh, which is its own issue for sure. So, you know, a couple of points that I wanted to make here um, are live demos are hard and scary. And um, while, you know, while we think of visualization as like, say, this, this bar chart, which I just threw in here to show you that it's as easy as, you know, appending dot plot um, to your data. Um, uh, Pandas has some built-in plotting, and you have a couple of really excellent options, which I included as imports at the top, though I didn't show you any sexy visualization because there isn't time for that. Is there time for anything? OK. Um, but you do have this option. But you know, uh, the table itself is a kind of visualization. Um, something I, my favorite part about my job is that after a while, I start, um, well, I start being able to find which table I rendered. Oh, yeah. Um, you, see, you see kind of a shape here. Um, let's see, or if we go up to the top. Um, you get a sense for, like, just thanks to the orders of magnitude, you see differences in population. And um, as you review within a particular zip code, um, as you go through the income tiers, you see differences in the... In the um, the population size and the like. Um, so, you, so you start developing, um, yeah, intuitions about like, like a sparsely populated place in Wyoming. Also, not all that shocking. Um, so this is just something I appreciate about this particular interface, both Python Notebook and Pandas, is that it allows you to iterate and to sketch and to screw up your code in the middle of a session and still come back from it because you could revisit and. Um, yeah, just have like a really flexible platform. And so this is, this is what I like to do as part of like a sketching step. But then you have the option to revisit what you've done, um, you know, clean up the data sets, like wrap things into functions if you need to. I like when I'm first going through Pandas to just do like function by function and see everything that I did, um, everything that, that, that was built in. And then if I need to wrap it up into something better. Um, but by the time you share that with somebody, you can use it as like a pedagogical tool. Um, or you can, you know, like I said, like I'm doing here, using it as a presentation. One of the things that I find more terrifying about trying to do a live presentation is that I have what Edward Tufte calls a problem of spatial adjacency versus temporal stacking. So if I were to give you slides today, I would have had to have understood in advance, and we've all been there, like, what is the next slide coming up? There's presenter mode at best, but you have like one slide, whereas like this makes sense for a narrative because I have this spatial adjacency. Um, and so um, it's a little noisier than a stack of cards, but um, you get to follow the flow of the narrative pretty well. So that's what I have um, for you today. These are some references. This is my Bible. I have actually, I carry this on the bus with me and most days, it's like part of my everyday carry. Um, a much more um, thorough introduction to pandas and what you can do with that is available thanks to Julia Evans. Um, and I, I read a couple of books um, on IPython Notebook and visualiz visualization in particular by um, Cyril Rosant, who has a great blog. And I, as always, you can, you can visit you know, other interesting notebooks and then just see other applications in a ver a, an enormous variety of disciplines. Um, for things you can use. So that's what I have.